All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to my presentation just after lunch. I, in case you're digesting and getting sleepy, I'll try to wake everybody up with a nice tale about our Boiler 2.0 air sourced steam generating heat pump. So my name is Roel Arts. I am the senior application engineer for Atmos Zero Europe, which is the wholly owned subsidiary of Atmos Zero Inc. Uh, a US-based company we've existed for a little over three years and we're doing high temperature heat pumps. So today I am going to give you uh, a talk where I will intend to tell you why it is we do what we do. I'll give an overview of the justification uh, for the choices that we made, which is primarily to do an air sourced steam generating heat pump. I will present our product and I will show you some test results that we've obtained with our prototype and we'll give an outlook on the first ins installations of our heat pump. So, process heat and steam. Why are we doing what we're doing? Well, if you're, if you're sitting here listening to my presentation, you probably already know that steam is still a very important carrier of energy uh, today. Of course, Steam kickstarted the Industrial Revolution some 250 years ago. Back then, it was used to, 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 uh, to uh, convert a thermal power into work. Today, uh, a key purpose of steam is just delivering process heat. In fact, about 50% of the industrial process heat today is delivered by steam. And I don't need to tell you how that steam is made. Usually that steam is made by setting something on fire and heating up some water and setting that something on fire, of course, gives greenhouse gas emissions. So it would be nice to have a different solution. And I think what's emerging compared to other solutions such as biomethane or hydrogen to, to burn, to make steam, I think electrification is the obvious way forward at this point. So that's where the heat pump com comes in. Um, and to give you a little bit more background of why we made the choices that we made in our heat pump, I'm just going to present a couple of different configurations for heat pumps. If you want to make steam, um, one thing you could do is just take a high temperature waste heat source, have a uh, a single cycle heat pump, upgrade that heat, uh, send it to a condenser with a, with a little steam generator, put in some water and voila, you've got some steam. If by, a, by some chance you, you've already optimized your process to the point where you no longer have this high temperature waste heat available, but you have some low temperature available. Um, if, if the heat pump works on classic vapor compression cycles, you're going to need a second cycle. So that's the middle picture. Um, if you have the second cycle anyway, you're going to be capable of having a high lift. So why not take the heat directly from the air? Well, there's plus and pluses and minuses to everything, right? Um, most of you are probably have an engineering background. So we, we all prefer to have the nice juicy thermodynamics of taking high temperature waste heat limiting the lift and getting a great COP that way. And you'll hear no objection from me that that's a very nice thing to do. But the thing is, um, you need to have this high temperature waste heat available consistently, and you're going to have to spend the, the effort and additional equipment to integrate that. So actually, we did an analysis using some, some benchmark figures. This was already presented at the, uh, uh, at the high temperature heat pump symposium in Copenhagen as well. Um, yeah, feel free to take pictures, but the slides are going to be on the internet after the, after the show. So, uh, but yeah, if you want to see them sooner, by all means, keep taking pictures. Um, our conclusion from this techno-economic analysis is basically summarized in this graph. If you use an e-boiler, then you'll quickly run up your electricity bill if you want to make steam. If you have higher temperature heat available, 
this will consistently cause your operating expense to go down because, well, simply you have to spend less electricity for the same amount of thermal power. But what we found in our preliminary market research is that uh, compared to the cost of the equipment, which is the green bars, the additional costs can, can balloon. And of course, this is, this is benchmark figures. In a given situation, it, it could be more, it could be less. It's, it's, it's based on, uh, on benchmark industry figures. But our conclusion is that in a lot of cases, you're not going to get an incremental return on investment if you spend the additional money on waste heat. Again, this is not a hard law. Every situation is different. This is to explain why we do what we do. In fact, in many cases, we find that the payback period of doing waste heat integration is going to exceed what a CTO will, will, will or, or a CFO will sign off on or even the technical lifetime of a, of a product in some cases. So our conclusion, waste heat is great. Use it. But to make a positive business case, in many cases, you just need it. You need to have it available consistently and at 60C. In other situations, we offer a different solution, which is a modular air sourced uh, scalable heat pump solution. Um, and just one side note, um, we're at Chill Venta here. Our product is an air sourced heat pump, but with a high lift, you can take away the air source and, and, and provide process cooling. Well, we have waste cooling available, essentially. So if you have a use for that, why not use it instead of give, get, giving the waste cooling to the air? So next slide, our system. Um, how does it work? What's in the box? So I'm hoping the video will run. See, yeah, it runs. So our system uses air coils to draw in the ambient air. It's, uh, it's connected to a glycol loop. It heats up the glycol, which enters the evaporator of our low temperature cycle, um, which upgrades the heat using one of our compressors to an intermediate temperature. And at this intermediate temperature in this intermediate heat exchanger, the heat is transferred to our um, high temperature cycle which is a similar cycle, but it ends in, in, in this um, a steam generating uh, condenser where you put in water and you get out steam. Um, I, again, this picture shows uh, a configuration with air coils on top, but there's no real reason why you could not just leave out these air coils and connect this glycol loop uh, to provide process cooling. Of course, that brings some challenges of its own because the loads have to be fairly well matched for that to, to work effectively, but it is an option. So, um, what's the status of our development? Well, we built an at-scale prototype. So, what you see here is a picture of our uh, R&D hall in Fort Collins, Colorado. This is... Uh, 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 a facility called the Powerhouse. It's operated by Colorado State University and it's where we built our first prototype. And this, this started making the first steam in October 2023. Um, and we've been testing and, and, and fine-tuning it ever since. Um, so by the way, the company was founded in, in Colorado. So our CTO, Todd Bandhauer, was a professor at Colorado State University. He's since, since with us, since we found the company, he's now with us full time. But uh, uh, um, that's basically a partnership we have for this development. So we've been testing and optimizing our products. So this is, um, these are a couple of, of recent results. Um, this is actually an extract for, for, from more comprehensive slides presented uh, at the heat transfer conference in Birmingham a couple of weeks ago, uh, but I can report that we've uh, reached stable steady state operation. We can push a button, heat up the system and start generating steam at 3.8 bar gauge, so 150C. 
uh, we've achieved good performances in our heat exchangers, tight pinches, um, and we've uh, we've already uh, um, um, accumulated a, a fair amount of running hours. I think we have something like 150 running hours on the system. So what's next for us? This is this is a nice prototype. It looks like a prototype, big and messy. Um, our next step is to make a, a real commercial pilot product, and I'm happy to report that we are hard at work building that, and we will be uh, installing and commissioning that in the coming months. And that would be at New Belgium Brewing. And confusingly, it's not in Belgium, it's in Colorado. It's a bunch of people in Colorado who really like the beer from Belgium and decided to start their own brewery. They want to have good beer in the US as well. Um, so that's gonna be a system making 165 uh, degree C steam, uh, one ton per hour. And that's also the capacity of our initial uh, series product. So a one ton per hour system. We're also planning uh, an EU pilot. I cannot disclose yet where it will be, but that's gonna be early 2026. And in 2026, we will also start a series production in our newly commissioned factory also in Colorado. It's in a place called Loveland, Colorado. It's a, it's a really nice hall from the pictures. I haven't visited it yet. I plan to visit there in a couple of weeks, but we'll be ready. We'll be scaling up series production um, in 2026. And for those of you who are not competitors of mine, uh, we're ready to take some orders as well. And if you're a competitor, come by anyway, see if, see if you can get me to give you a quote. Um, anyway, this is what our product will look like, and we have a nifty little skill model on our booth in the Stark Hub area in Hall 9, so be sure to swing by and, uh, and have a look. And thank you all for your, uh, your after-lunch attentive listening. So I think there's some time for questions, so... The question was which refrigerants we we're using, and uh, this initial series product will run on synthetic refrigerants, low GWP HFOs. Uh, we do have our roadmap to uh, make a variant with natural refrigerants, specifically for the EU market, but that will come a little bit later. So our, our initial product is really focused on getting into market, so that's uh, low GWP uh, HFOs. How big the COP is the question. So our target COP, which we do not reach yet with the first pilot system delivered, is a COP of two when lifting from 15C ambient air to 150C steam. Uh, it's, it's a challenging target. It's, uh, it's more than 60% of Carnot. So at our first try, we have some optimization to reach it, but that's the target. If there's... No more questions. Thank you again for all your attention and uh, I hope to see you at our booth.